Hi everybody, I'm Sam. Um, welcome to Gallery Bites, where we're gonna take a deep dive into a piece from the Crocker's Permanent Collection. I'm so excited to be here with you today, but a little unnerved. I'm used to being a docent at the Crocker where I've been for the last 10 years, but I'm used to talking to you in person. And I don't like the conversations that we have back and forth. Um, but as it turns out, we can do that today. If this is your first time in a Gallery Bites, we're broadcasting live. Uh, I understand we're both on YouTube and Facebook Live, and so you can leave us comments. If you have a question or a comment that you want to make, put it in the comments. It'll be relayed to me in real time, and we can get it answered for you. One catch, if you're new to this, is that if you're on uh, YouTube, you'd need to have a YouTube account and signed into it in order for us to get the comment. Don't worry though, even if you don't have a YouTube account, you can still watch this presentation and you can still listen to the comments that other people make. And by the way, if even that is too much trouble, just see me in the gallery. You know I'm always here. You can always see me in person. I guess I should be nervous today because what I'm doing is out of my comfort zone, looking at you through a camera lens instead of in person. But to be honest, what I really am is excited because the piece that we've chosen for you today is extraordinary. I couldn't wait, I couldn't say yes fast enough once it was proposed to me that this was the one we were going to do. And it's behind me. It's Masami Teraoka's Samurai and Razor. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces here. Um, I think maybe we should begin, though, with a quick disclaimer. I think in some of the past uh, gallery bites that we've done, they've done the presentation twice. They'll show one piece of art and kids will watch it, and then they'll show another piece of art and adults will watch it. This one, just so we're clear, is for adults. Um, some of you may came, maybe came to us from the Crocker's website where it was mentioned that it was for an adult, but some of you might have come from a, an email that went out today where there was no mention of the adult content, and it's going to be there. There is, for instance, going to be a pretty frank discussion of sex um, because it's necessary to talk about the piece. So if you're a teacher or a parent and you had intended to show this to your kids, I would strongly suggest that you watch it first before you do that. Okay, with that, I, why don't we talk a little bit first about the artist. Masama Terioki is a, a Japanese born and raised artist who moved to the US to LA in 1962, just as the pop art movement is exploding. And he establishes himself after his schooling there as an artist with a unique niche. What he does is he takes um, drawings that are done in the style of Edo period woodcuts. Edo period, that is Japanese from, say, 1603 to about 1867 or 1868. He does them beautifully, but he combines them with pop culture elements from Western society in a way that is very charming. We have, I have a, a, a slide for you that I want to show you of a, of a self-portrait done by Tara Oka. Tara Oka in that style. Um, it's so expressive. Look at the line work he's got. Um, I, I, it's just gorgeous. Um, could you show the next slide, please, though, of the, an example of his, what we're calling Edo pop work? It's Edo pop in that it looks like it's from the Edo period, but if you look closely, you'll see surprising things. Here you've got a geisha's feet as she teeters along in those wooden clogs that would give her that sort of mincing gait that men found so attractive. But she's also raised up off of the street to avoid the trash. And did, can you see what the trash is? She's stepping over a Big Mac, right? This is the kind of thing that we fell in love with and uh, Tara Oka's career took off. For the next 20 years, he was doing this kind of thing. It's very light. If there's a theme, it's sort of East meets West. It's um, modern meets tradition, but it's very lighthearted. A number of his pieces, though, have a very sort of sex positive look. Some might even say sex forward look. Um, so much so that a friend of mine told me that he saw an exhibition of Tara Oka's work recently in Honolulu and they had the gallery cordoned off so that if you were a minor you couldn't even get into it. Well, ours is relatively tame, but it's of a different period from his work because in the mid-80s something happened in the U.S. that caused him to switch gears from the light-hearted um, work of the last 20 years into something darker and more topical. And that's where our piece comes in. That's what we're going to look at. Um, what I like to start with in a piece like this is, and I hate this term, but I'm going to use it, a formal analysis. That sounds so scary. But all that means is before we start peeling back the layers of the onion and diving into what it means and what the symbolism is and what the politics of the era were and any of that, we're just going to talk about what we see on the screen behind us, right? What it looks like. Um, so let me move up to the, you're going to see me bounce in front of the um, work most of the time because I like to move around and I want to point out some good things to you. But what we've got here is a main character. And we're told from the gallery label that it's a samurai. Um, he's holding his hands in a very sort of awkward position. Can you see that sort of, 
Yeah, and the way his fingertips sort of bend up funny like that. Um, and he's got two objects in his hands too. Can you make out what they are? He's got in the one hand, what is clearly a disposable plastic razor. And in the other hand, he's holding this oval disc, which if you've read the title of today's work, you know is a condom. Um, I don't tour this piece with kids, actually, but you have to walk past it. And it's so colorful that kids, of course, are gonna glom onto it. So the other day, as I was walking past it with some little kids behind me, like little ducklings, one of the boys glances over and he said, oh, look, he's got a cookie. He's got a cookie. And, and I had a flash of, should I make this a teachable moment? But instead I just said, mm-hmm, and kept going. But it is a condom. Um, then you've got this interesting bit here where you've got this giant sort of fluttering swath of this beautiful pattern that looks all from the world like it's coming out of the back of his head. And it sort of uh, descends down like this into this sort of pyramid shape. And then it disappears into sort of a turbulence at the bottom. Um, and then when we work our way over here, you've got this curve of white. It's beautiful, but then you have this gorgeous sort of wallpaper pattern of what appears to be calligraphy that stretches across the back. Can you see it? Begins over here and moves this way. And then when you get over to the far side, it becomes bound by these sort of shapes. You've got those sort of oval cartouche shapes, and in the corner you have some more rectangular shapes. Spectacular looking, right? It's the kind of piece that when I watch people walk around the corner, they gasp. Um, but there's something you need to know about what I'm seeing versus what you're seeing. Um, when you round the corner here, because it's so large and so complex, you have this really strong physical sense that you need to back up to take it all in. Um, you really, your body, everything about you is telling you you need to back up so that you can take it all in at a glance. However, because of where this piece is situated in the gallery, you can't back up. Right where your body is telling you it wants you to stand, there's a giant sculpture of a, what is it, like 10, 15 feet tall of a glitter-covered blue cow that's being lassoed by a vaquero. So you're forced to stand where I am, which is a bit uncomfortably close to this piece. So close that it fills your peripheral vision to the left and the right and the top and the bottom. It gives you a real immersive sense that you're in it. It's a very physical sense and it's a little disconcerting because you can't take the entire pattern in in one piece, in one glance, but it's kind of trippy and fun. Truth is, at home, you're actually probably getting a better view of it than I am here because you are looking at it on a smaller screen and you can probably get a better sense of what's happening. So there are advantages to both. Um, but when we talk about what's going on here, what is happening when we try and dive deeper, um, I actually asked this question to a few docents yesterday. I said, what, what do you think about that samurai painting? And one of them said, and she actually may be in the room with us today, she said, oh yeah, that samurai is getting ready for a hot night. He's grooming for a hot night and he's got that uh, condom so he won't have any samurai babies. I mean, that makes some sense, right? I mean, you can see what the clues were and why she said what she said, but let me tell you, that's not it. That's not what's going on here. And to understand what is going on here, you actually really only need two clues. Two clues and you can understand this on the top level. And those two clues, well, we've discussed one of them. One of them is the condom. He's got a condom in his hand. The only other clue you need to understand the, the big issue here is the date that it was painted. If you know when this was painted and you know he's got a condom in his hand, you understand what it's all about. And the date was 1989, okay? Let me tell you, I was living in New York City in 1989, having moved there in 1986. And in the 80s, the mid to late 80s, if you saw a work of art with a condom in the late 80s, that painting is about AIDS, period. End of story, full stop. You know, if, if this painting had been done in the 70s, then that lady might have been correct. It might very well have been about preventing pregnancy. But in the 80s and mid to late 80s, that painting is about AIDS. You know that for a fact. And that is what's going on here. But exactly what? It's a little bit of a mystery because there's a samurai? I mean, what's that about? And why has he got a razor? And what's, you know, what's, what's happening here? Well, here's where it gets tricky. Because to really pick it apart and understand exactly what's going on, you need to know a lot. You need to know a lot, and you need to know a lot of things that, well, tend not to be known by those of us in the Western world because they deal with things that are happening in Japan. If you wanted to pick this apart, and we're gonna, you would have to know about, and this is just a partial list, you guys, you would have to know about the Edo period in Japan, the dates that it happened, what was going on politically, what was it like socially, what, um, what were the, the, the hallmarks of that era and what sort of arts and things happened during the Edo period? You would have to know about samurai. You'd have to know about 
um, what rank they had in society, what they did, what they looked like, what they wore, what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do. You would have to know about kabuki theater. What was it? What was the life of a kabuki actor like? How were they portrayed in art? You would have to know about the Yakuza, believe it or not. You'd have to know about the Yakuza who are like the Japanese mafia. What did they look like? How would you have recognized them in a crowd? What did Japanese people think about them back then? And what do they think about them now? And well, not finally, actually. Here's a kicker. You would have to be able to read that writing that's behind me. Where that's tricky is, that's not modern Japanese. Initially, I thought, that'll be a piece of cake. I have an app for that. Well, it turns out there is no app for that because that is a version of, China, of Japanese that hasn't been spoken since the Edo period, written since the Edo period, and there are only a handful of people left who can translate it. And finally, if you're any younger than me, because I'm looking at some people behind the camera who are all younger than me, you would kind of have to have some sort of an, um, a fairly in-depth knowledge of pop culture in the U.S. in the 80s. Right? Because this piece deals with that as well. Um, if you're a research nerd, this is the piece for you. This is the piece for you because it will lead you down endless rabbit holes of research and each one is more fascinating than the next. But I do acknowledge that most of us are busy and don't have time to go do that kind of crazy amounts of research. Have no fear if that's you because I've got you covered, I've done the heavy lifting for you, and I'm going to give you the benefit of all the crazy research that I've done so that you'll be able to make up your own mind. Keeping in mind, at the end, I'm going to give you sort of my analysis of this piece, but that's just my analysis. It's based on what I see, but it's also based on my life experience. I was living in New York City as a young man during this period. Tara Oka was living in LA. Your life is different. You may come up with a different analysis. So I'm going to be very curious, either in the comments or if you see me in person, to hear what you think, if you think that maybe I was off base, if you have a different idea, I'm going to love to hear what you say about it. So let's start taking it apart, right? Why don't we start with, well, let's just start with the top of his head and go around, okay? When I looked at this first and recognized him as a samurai, really only because the title says that, I knew immediately that there were two sort of odd anachronistic elements, right? And it's this razor and the condom. I mean, you know right away that those don't belong. But the rest of it, if I'm perfectly honest, look kind of right to me. What is it Stephen Colbert says? It has truthiness. It looks right. You know, it seems like it might be right. And I didn't honestly, if I'm completely honest, entirely know what like their hair do's even looked like. I knew that it was something elaborate and it was kind of long, but beyond that I wasn't really sure if they had variations or whatever. But I'm here to tell you that this is not the allowable hairstyle for a samurai during the Edo period. In fact, there was only one. It's called the Chonmage, and I have a photograph of you of a samurai from the period. These photographs make me so happy because we're lucky that the end of the Edo period, which is the end of the samurai, kind of overlapped with the beginning of photography. And so we have some good extant photographs of actual samurai in their gear. So the Chonmage is like you see here. It's got the top of the head shaved bald, unless I guess you were bald there. And then the sides are waxed and oiled back on the sides into this kind of cobra hood effect. But then it's caught up in the back in a ponytail and kind of coiled and flapped over the top like a scorpion's tail. The end. That's your only choice. It was mandated by law. Um, the, I, they said that it made it easier to wear their, wear their helmets. I don't know. But our guy has something other than that. <laughs> um, can you make out what he's got? If, you're, if you lived in the 80s, you know it. Um, he's got, what, what did we used to say? Business in the... Business in the front, party in the back, yeah, it's a mullet. He's got a really hardcore, like, Billy Ray Cyrus-style mullet, which to Western eyes looks fine, but it's completely wrong for a samurai. The Japanese in this era, and it's an aphorism that's still used today, had a saying that says, uh, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. This was not an era where individuality was celebrated. There were strict rules. The, there's, the society during the Edo period was very peaceful. They weren't fighting any wars, and so all their diversions sort of began to flourish. The arts were all uh, jumping. Um, but other diversions, like kabuki theater, kind of a wild, raunchy theater that was um, sexually pretty explicit, were also hopping. And other diversions, like the Yoshiwara district, which is the red light district, were also hopping. So it was a very hedonistic time with a lot of cool stuff happening. But 
In order to keep society running smoothly, they also installed during this period an incredible number of rules of behavior. You had to wear the right hairstyle depending on your rank, and you only had one choice. You had to dress a certain way, you had to behave a certain way, you could talk to certain people, you couldn't talk to other people, and you could only go to certain areas of town depending on what your rank was. There were a lot of rules, and breaking them was um, considered extremely deviant behavior and could be punished in a criminal way. That hairstyle would have had him punished in that way. So right away we know our guy's a rule breaker. The next thing we look at here is this little, can you make it out? The little ear cuff, right? Again, I thought, okay, I guess Samurai had earrings. No, they did not. They absolutely did not have earrings, and certainly if they'd had them, I guess they would have been down here, not up here like our guys is. That's another sort of Western 80s kind of thing that he's got going on, but again, for our Samurai, that would be flamboyant and deviant and would be punished. Here's where it gets interesting, though when you look at the mustache, right? So if you are a crocker baby or a docent or have actually most of us probably at some point have seen those Edo period uh, samurai suits of armor, they're very elaborate, they have these incredible helmets. The Edo period was very peaceful, they weren't fighting wars. So if you were a samurai, your suit of armor didn't necessarily have to be terribly functional it just had to look fabulous, right, in a parade or something. And so they got more and more and more elaborate. The, head, the headdresses, the masks in particular, got crazy. They might have been made of paper mache towards the end, but it didn't matter because nobody was going to hit you with a sword. It just had to look really good. And every single one of them has a big bushy mustache, just like our guy has. So you would be excused to believe, if you believed, as I did, that those masks existed because that's the way samurai looked. Well, that's not true either. It's not true at all. In fact, if you were a samurai in medieval times, like before the Edo area, era, in fact, they all did have big bushy mustaches. I have a, photo, a woodcut, I think, of a, of a medieval um, samurai. And you see how he's got that crazed, big bushy beard? The facial hair is called hige, and hige was not only encouraged, it was mandated, and the bushier the better. If you were one of those sad samurai who could only grow a sparse beard, you made one out of horse hair and glued it to your face like a face toupee, right? But when the Edo period kicked in, peace was what was wanted. And so the shogunate ruled that to wear hige, which was supposed to be a symbol of your fierce warrior spirit and your desire to fight battles and your testosterone-fueled monstrosity, right? That indicated during the peaceful Edo period that you were, it was tantamount to inciting insurrection. It meant that you were ready to fight. And so the rule came down that all samurai had to be clean shaven. I mean, that's actually still, in polite Japanese society, still the case today. If you're working on any job that has you in contact with the public, you can be fired for growing a mustache. So while that might look right to us for having seen uh, all those masks with the mustaches, it's completely wrong for a samurai. Again, that would be criminal behavior that he's um, exhibiting right there, and he would be the nail sticking up that would need to be hammered down. Another interesting thing, I think, is this big swash of pattern here. It's beautiful, right? But it's a bit confusing because it looks like, to me anyway, like a fabric pattern maybe? I'm standing in the way of it. It looks like a fabric pattern, um, and it continues down into this sort of turbulence here, which looks a bit like water, which is in fact what it is, but isn't it confusing? It's beautiful um, uh, cherry blossoms and sort of cloud-like swirls, but it looks like he's in a bath. So what's he doing wearing a kimono in the bath, right? Well, truth is, that's not a kimono, and there are clues as to what it is. If you look here at his wrist, you can see that there's no sign of a, of a sleeve here or here, it just kind of fades off. Um, but it's tricky to read because patterns are generally re rendered differently in Edo period woodcuts and our artists has picked it up. They were really into that pattern. They loved the gorgeous kimono patterns that were very elaborate. And so if we were to render it in a Western style, a modern Western style, if it wraps around your arm, the pattern would foreshorten and wrap around. If it went through some wrinkles like this, the pattern would really wrinkle so that we could see the form that was underneath it. But it makes the pattern obscured, and they really wanted to show off the pattern, and so they tend to make it, um, in, in Edo period woodcuts, they tend to do it almost as though it's like cut out of paper and they just stuck it on. 
So the pattern looks better, but it's really hard to understand what the figure is underneath it. And some of that's going on here. It's a little hard to suss out. But can you see? I think from home maybe you can. That what we're looking at is him kind of hunched over like this. Um, maybe this way. Yeah, this way. He's hunched over and in such a way that what we see as fluttering out of the back of his head is actually his back. He's hunched over in the bath and this is his shoulder. Can you make it out? His bicep here. And so his arm comes down like this and then bends up and goes that way. So what we're looking at is a man who is in the bath, not in a kimono, but naked as he should be, makes more sense that way. And the smoking gun that tells us that he's naked is right here. I don't know if you can give us a close-up of that, but um, it's my favorite part of the whole painting. Um, this then would be his armpit. Can you see it? There's his arm, this is his armpit. So that's a little tuft of armpit hair. So yes, he's naked in the bath and he's wearing a full body tattoo. And again, not knowing more than I did when I began this research, I thought, okay, well, I guess samurai had Tattoos. I, we, Japanese tattoos are a thing, right? Well, no, they absolutely did not. Um, tattoos of this sort, full body tattoos, are the purview of the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia, started in the Edo period and actually still existing today. Here's an archival photograph of an, a Yakuza member with that full body tattoo on. Those people were the worst of the worst in Edo society, which was supposed to be peaceful because they were very violent. They had these full body tattoos that marked them as Yakuza. They have another thing they do. Um, I almost included a photo of it, but it was too gruesome, where they cut off their pinky to let you know that they're loyal. There's, even today, there's a thriving business in prosthetic pinkies so that you can wear it and kind of blend in with society. But, um, so if, because Japanese society uh, um, uh, com sees these tattoos as indicative of Yakuza and crim criminality and um, people that need to be avoided. Today, and in the Edo period, anybody with a tattoo is absolutely forbidden from entering a Japanese bath of any sort. If you were to go to a Japanese bath, today even, you would find a sign out front, I think I've got an example of one of the signs, um, that shows you that um, anyone who tries to enter here with a tattoo will not be allowed. And they're showing tiny little tattoos in a lot of them. So even if our guy was only wearing this one little bitty red one, he still would be chastised and ejected. But if he's wearing a full body, absolutely 100% Yakuza tattoo, he would be marked as a criminal and would be kicked out. Right? The, the nail that's sticking up, got to hammer it down. Um, so everything we're looking at here is evidence of Western sort of stuff that to us looks right. But in terms of his being a samurai, it would be seen as um, deviant behavior, worthy of uh, discrimination, and worthy of, of uh, chastisement, right? We left out one bit, though, that we've got to talk about. Um, the condom, the star of the show. Okay, here's where it gets weird. Um, he's kind of, can you see how he's kind of huddled together, like he's got the condom and the, and the razor sort of huddled there together? Um, it's unclear what he's doing. The Crocker's gallery label, I don't know, do you guys read them? Do you read the gallery labels? You should, because if you don't, they're, the Crockers are better than most museums that I've ever been to. They're written by our curatorial staff and they're just top notch. But this one says something really weird. It says that our samurai, something like he's afraid of AIDS or something, so he's in the bath and he's shaving, and if he nicks himself, he's gonna catch the blood in the condom. Um, Does that make any sense to anybody? Does that sound like rational human behavior to anybody? Is that what someone would do? It never made sense to me because there are any number of ways you could treat that, but would catching in a condom be one of those ways? It doesn't make sense. Um, but listen, lest you think that I'm accusing the Crocker uh, curatorial stuff of getting it wrong, that wording and that explanation comes directly from the artist, word for word. That's what Terraoka says is his explanation for what's happening there, strange as it sounds. And I gotta admit, I kind of banged my head against a wall for a long time on that one because it was so irrational. Well, it turns out the fact that it's irrational is the point. Recently, I found an interview with him from a Melbourne newspaper where he was talking specifically about his use of condoms in this series and this symbolism. And yes, one part of it is what we have said, which is just it's a universal symbol for AIDS. But beyond that, he said, we were getting this strong message during the 80s that it was all about condoms. We don't have drugs yet, but condoms will fix it. If you use condoms, there's no worry. You're good with condoms. Use condoms. He wanted to point out to people two things. One, that 
nothing's foolproof. You know, you use the wrong lube, that condom breaks. There's any number of things that can happen, even if you're being careful. So he was like, you still have to be wary. And if you're using it wrong, if you're relying on misinformation, um, if you're panicked and are getting, you know, if someone on Facebook's telling you something silly and you follow their lead, if you do something stupid like this, then it's less than no use. So the fact that what he's doing is irrational is kind of the point. I was thinking the other day about the beginning of the COVID epidemic when my mom is like spraying bleach on potato chip bags and stuff. We, were, we didn't know. We were scared. And people were scared and they were relying on strange information. We didn't totally know what was going on. And you know, insanity like this may have happened. Um, so the fact, that it's, the fact that it's irrational is sort of the point here. Um, but it brings me to something else, <laughs> which is we've got him now finally in this bath, right? He's in the bath, he's in a hot bath. Can you see the little steam lines coming up here? I think there's some over here too, to let us know that he's in a hot bath. And he's got this turbulent water, which the crocker, honestly, I do think incorrectly labels as bubbles. I think it's just turbulence. It's like hot tub water, you know? Can you, am I in the way? You can see it. Um, okay. I said some of my analysis is based on my, where I lived and what, what my age and where I was. So I'm living in New York City in 1986, certainly in 1989 when this happens. And I'm telling you that if I or anyone I knew had been shown this picture of a man with a cool trendy haircut and a cool piercing and a big brushy, what we would, have, we would have called like a porn stash, like a, like a Freddie Mercury kind of porn stash, and a really cool tattoo with a condom in a hot tub, we would have placed him in a gay bathhouse. And the reason we would have done that is because that was a real hot button topic going on then. Early on, we didn't totally understand what was happening, how you got it, how it worked. There was an incorrect assumption that um, Maybe, maybe, <laughs> it seemed to be gay men getting it, maybe every time gay men had sex, a teeny bit of the virus was exchanged, but it wasn't enough to get you sick. You have a little bit more gay sex, you got a little bit more, and eventually, if you were the kind of person that was having a whole lot of gay sex, maybe you'd build up enough that you'd get AIDS. That's incorrect, but that's what they thought. And they were looking at sort of following people who had become infected back, and they, one thing they seemed to have in common is that they were having a lot of sex, and they seemed to be congregating in these gay bathhouses. So it was in all the newspapers through the mid-'80s into the, into the early-'90s. Um, it was a big battle, debate. Should we close them or not? The people who were <laughs> proponents of leaving them open said, wait, is what you're telling me that you think that if we close the gay bathhouses, that gay men are going to stop having sex? Is that what you're saying? Because what's really going to happen is you're going to you know, drive them into the alley or whatever. Why not leave them open and use it as a place to spread safe sex messages and pass out condoms and all that? But by that point, by this time this was painted, they had all been shut down, but the appeals were constantly in the newspaper. So it was a big hot button topic that everybody would have known about in 1989. And so this is me, okay? This is me, but I contend that even though Tara Oka and Nora the Crocker mentions the gay bathhouse angle, I think it's at work there. Um, both. He's in a Japanese bath, but there's this gay bathhouse angle going too. But then that brought me to my next rabbit hole of research, which is, is Tara Oka somehow insinuating that there's a connection between the historical samurai and gay men? Because that's who's going to these bathhouses. I mean, it doesn't make sense, does it? So I did some research at the rest of the series. What you're seeing on the screen right now is another painting from the series. The series is called Tale of a Thousand Condoms. And in that series, the main characters are always either a samurai, like ours, or a geisha, like the one you're looking at now. OK, in this one, the geisha is, um, can, is that, yeah, put that up. The geisha is frantically tearing at some condoms and her eyebrows are raised. She's shocked because what you might be able to see, if you look close, it took me a while to see it, on the far right of the screen at about her elbow, a skeletal hand is reaching in. This is her client, who she recognizes, who's crawling in from the side. You can even see the top of his skull there behind the hand. And in the calligraphy behind her, that's a quote from him. He's saying, I was so embarrassed on the subway over here because everybody was looking at me because I'm a skeleton, I'm frightening. Right? And she's like, oh God, she's ripping open the condoms. Sex workers were one of the three groups that was considered to be th the people at most risk for getting AIDS. The biggest group, of course, was gay men. Then there were IV drug users and there were sex workers. Now, honestly, of course, Geisha did more than just sex work, but that was part of the deal. 
right? Especially if you were a higher end when you might be also playing music and stuff, but you were having sex for money. And if you were a lower end geisha, you were essentially just a sex worker. So they make that, she makes a perfect historical foil um, for someone likely to get AIDS. So was there something like that at work with our samurai, right? I mean, it didn't make sense, but I felt like I should at least research it. Oh my gosh, people, you're not gonna believe. Um, well, maybe you would, but I was shocked. In fact, research nerds out there, if there are any of you, go, once this is over, wait till we're done, once this is over, Google gay samurai, pop some popcorn and get ready because it's fascinating. Here's the deal. Samurai during the Edo period had a code that they lived by. It's called Bushido. It's like our, it's kind of like analogous to chivalry, but that was broken down into sort of subsections. And one of those subsections was called Shudo or Waka Shudo, which translates roughly to the way of men or the way of young men. Because every samurai, veteran, you know, full tilt samurai, was expected to take under his wing an apprentice samurai, a younger man, who he was supposed to rear up and teach to fight, to use the sword, all the battle strategies, but also the ways of being a gentleman and a, an elite class man. You needed to know poetry and painting. And you were having sex. That was part of the deal. That was the deal. Um, you know, your parents were thrilled by this. They had proposed you to this guy. It was like an honor, but, it was, but, but there was a lot of male-on-male -male sex going on with these samurai. Now, they might also have a wife, but the deal with the wife was that was so they could have babies so they could have an heir. That kind of sex, the sex with their wife, was considered feminizing in some way and mm, not quite as good. The good stuff, they thought, was with the man, uh, the young man that they were uh, teamed up with. But at least those two were kind of monogamous relationships, so they were kind of bisexual. They wouldn't have thought of it that way. But remember I said that the Yoshiwara, the red light district that was booming during this time, was hopping? The samurai weren't allowed to go because they were elite, and that was like beneath them. But there was a workaround, okay? There was a disguise that they were allowed to wear, and I have a photograph of that, of that disguise that the samurai could wear to sneak into the Yoshiwara district. It was this kind of basket-like hat overturned on their head, which kind of, sort of, covered their head. And then there was a kind of a cloak. You wouldn't have flapped it open like he's got, because you wanted it to cover up your sword, because that was one of the things that let them know you were a samurai. But here's the thing, they were all wearing that same disguise. So was it a disguise? You knew who they were, but it did give them enough propriety to where they could go. They were the number one client of these sex workers. And yes, they were seeing some female sex workers like the geisha, but primarily they were seeing male sex workers who usually were kabuki theater performers. You'd perform on the stage and then you'd perform backstage. So our samurai is having a lot of sex with a lot of people. Most of them are men. So yes, surprise, surprise, it turns out that he's a perfect foil for a profligate, uh, gay sex having um, person at the front line of AIDS and worried about catching it, historically speaking. To me, I found that really interesting. Um, I did promise you that I was going to give you a translation. <laughs> that was the trickiest bit, people. That was really hard. Because as I said, this is an archaic form of Japanese that is no longer written, and no one knows how to read it, practically, a small handful of people. I went to our curator who had acquired this for us, she couldn't read it. I went to the curator of our Asian collection. She couldn't read it either. None of my Japanese friends could help, of course, so I was stymied. So in my sort of scrambling, I just started looking online for email addresses that might maybe be associated with Terraoka, and what I found was what you'd expect, gallerists and art, artist rep representatives and things like that. But then there was this one curious email that looked suspiciously like a personal email address, so I just took a shot, and I wrote a fawning email to whoever this was, and I dropped the Crocker's name a lot. And within the hour, I got the kindest, most gracious email back from Tara Oka, because it was him. And he told me all kinds of good stuff, most of which I've already told you, but he also translated it for me. He went through it word for word and told me everything that's in here and saved me. And so now I'm gonna tell you. Um, in the part that's behind my head here, and then extending across that way, it reads, in Japan, nearly 300 people, it's an Aizuwa, or AIDS victims, in Japan, nearly 300, but in the US, nearly 30,000. And I guarantee you that in 1989, that 30,000 was supposed to make us clutch our pearls and gasp, but the 300 was supposed to make the people in Japan take notice because as he was planning this series in 1989, he took a, he was already formulating it, he took a trip to Melbourne, which I think was for an exhibition, 
And he thought, while I'm here, let's go see how the people in Australia are dealing with AIDS because it had been in their country since 82, but it was kept really low. He went to the hospital and they said, you know, we're not really worried about that. Um, that's an American problem. We're not, we don't think it's gonna be an issue here. And he said, well, what sort of precautions are you taking? They said, well, we got it. You know, we're wearing those paper booties that you put over your shoes and those little paper hats. So we think we're good. I mean, craziness. So he decided that the idea that other nations were blithely assuming that this was an American problem and that their precautions were deranged is something that he needed to address. Um, so that part where he said in Japan, nearly 300, that was, that was important because that's him like sort of warning, um, you know, it's coming. Be prepared. Japan, if you think this is a Western problem, you're, you're fooling yourself. Um, the thing was, I was so excited to get that email, which by the way, I have saved. I still have it. Um, oh, it was like a, an email from a hero or something. Um, I didn't notice until a few days later that he didn't translate this part, which looks really important. It's the one um, tattoo character that's on his body and it's in bright, well, kind of bright orangey red. Um, and so I meekly wrote him back. I was like, um, did you, you know, uh, you know, radio silence. No response, and I didn't know if he was keeping it a secret or had I used up my goodwill or what, so I just kind of dropped it. But I had resigned myself to the fact that we were probably never gonna know what the tattoo on his shoulder blade read as. Let me get this way. Um, but then something wonderful happened. About a year later, I was touring this mother and daughter, Japanese Americans, um, the, the daughter is probably my age, maybe 10 years older than me, something like that. And the mom, though, had to be like late 80s. If you're watching, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm bad with ages, but late 80s, maybe early 90s, but sharp, sharp, sharp. And I didn't want the tour to end, so I said, will you come look at this piece with me because I would really like to get your take on it. Um, so we were talking about it, and I was translating um, this thing for them. And I said, but we'll, we may never know what the... What the bit right here says, because nobody can read it. Um, and she said, oh, I can read it. I'm like, how can you possibly read it? You're, you're not 160 years old. Nobody can read this anymore. And she said, well, here's the thing. My grandmother was the historian in her little village in Japan. And she had to learn it because she was in charge of archiving all these antique you know, documents. And as a young child, she taught it to me, and I still remember it. So here's the truth. Um, I presented this piece to docents back in 2016, and I didn't know this then, so if there are any of you on camera, listen up, because this is new news. Um, back then, AIDS, of course, didn't exist, but venereal diseases did. And if you had one, those are the two characters that you would use in conjunction to mean that. So our, this, you guys, this is like our, our, a scarlet letter he's wearing, basically, that brands him as someone having AIDS on his body. Um, it's important. And there's one more important clue going on here. I mean, in the beginning, when they were talking about the silliness of the condom and the blood, I was like, is he trying to keep himself from getting AIDS, or is he worried that he has AIDS and he's trying to keep other people from getting it? Well, it's the latter, because clearly he's got the tattoo that's telling us that he has AIDS. But there's another thing. Remember I said that this is kind of a kabuki depiction of a samurai. It's almost as though this is a kabuki actor portraying a samurai. Well, kabuki have very um, specific makeup that their characters wear that indicate certain things. If you have red lines in a certain configuration, as soon as you walk out on stage, everybody back to the balcony knows exactly what kind of personality you are and what to expect from you. They all know. Well, there's a convention at work here, too. Can you make it out on camera? There's sort of a blue haze that, that's sort of airbrushy looking across his eyes right here, and it's also on his fingertips here, right? That's not an accident. In kabuki parlance, if you are a character who walks on stage with that blue haze across your eyes and on your fingertips, that means you are either a ghost or you're getting ready to be a ghost. So our guy has AIDS, and not only that, but he's not long for this world. There's another clue, though, in his tattoo. It's gorgeous, and it's cherry blossoms, but it's not uh, random. Cherry blossoms have two significant symbols uh, for terra oka. One is, if you've ever been around cherry blossoms, they bloom in profusion, just boof, all of a sudden they're just glorious. Um, but then they fall almost as quickly. If the wind blows, like it is here, um, the blooming season's really short, they bloom really fast, and then they fall really fast. For that reason, they typically have the symbolism of 
uh, intransience of life, um, uh, life gone too soon, a vanitas kind of an idea. For terra oka, though, specifically, they also have the meaning of memory. So we're looking at the memory of people gone too soon. And when I think about that, I guess it kind of chokes me up because if you were working in a creative field in New York City during the 80s, like I was, watching people just drop like flies, it's, it's a little poignant to see. And that brings me to another poignant moment, and that's the reason why Terra Oka came up with this series in the first place. It was mid-80s when he got the idea, and AIDS existed and he knew about it, but it was kind of, what's the word? Abstract to him until a good friend of his, a young woman, had a newborn baby. And the baby had some medical problem, they never say quite what it is, but needed a transfusion, a blood transfusion, as a newborn. And this was the early days of AIDS when they weren't really screening the blood supply as carefully as they do now, and so the baby was infected with this tainted blood and had AIDS. This was before there were good medicines and stuff, so that baby's gonna die. That poor newborn's gonna die, and because of the panic and paranoia that people had, but also the virulent homophobia against people with AIDS, um, the amount of discrimination they were facing. The woman's landlord kicked her out in the street with that baby, a baby who was surely gonna die. So she spends her last moments, you know, trying to find a roof to put over this baby's head. Tara Oka was, was, was horrified by this. He said, we're taking what is a public health issue, and instead of putting our arms around these people who maybe are gonna die, but at least giving them our love, our neighbors, instead what we're doing is we are politicizing the issue, and we are uh, moralizing about the issue, and we're weaponizing the issue, right? Does that sound familiar to anybody? And that's actually why I really wanted to talk to you about this because I think it has such a resonance with what's going on in the world today. So if you add up everything that we've looked at today, you've got our samurai with all these accoutrements that look right to us, but for a samurai are completely wrong, illegal, some of them, but in any case, he's bucking the accepted rules of society. He's not living the right way, so he really gets anything he deserves, he should be punished. That's certainly analogous to the plight of gay men and people with AIDS, the amount of discrimination they were suffering. So what's going on here, there are two things at work, to me, anyway. One is that this is a piece specifically about the discrimination that people with AIDS suffered during the 80s. Um, and the other thing is that, remember that in Japan 300? He's also sending a warning out to the world. Um, it's a global warning with an N, global warning, that it's coming your way, don't think it's not gonna affect you. This is not an American problem, it's not a gay problem, it's not an IV drug user problem, it's a problem for all of us. So, I used to look at this painting before COVID, you know, and I think this is important, this message is important because younger people don't know about it. And we need, you know, if we don't pay attention to history, we're doomed to repeat it, you know, but surely at least we learn something from it. Only now, in the throes of COVID, I realized we haven't learned anything. Um, if you are a gay man who lived through the 80s, or if you know any, ask them about the PTSD they were feeling at the start of the COVID epidemic. The idea, thinking back to that time when there was a sword hanging over your head every day, you crave human interaction, you crave closeness, let's call it, um, but what, is it worth the possibility that some silly mistake might be the thing that kills you? Cut forward to today, I really wanna go hug my mom, but is it worth taking the chance that that might be the hug that kills one or both of us. Um, we're doing silly things, we're weaponizing this, we're politicizing this, we're moralizing about it instead of doing what we need to do, which is just look out for one another and think about um, keeping everybody safe and well. So that's why I conquered my nerves today to speak to you about this painting because I think it's an important one for us today. Um, I also need to put in a plug because you've seen a lot of it. You can see most of it. I've probably stood in the way of a good bit of it. Um, but there are things you can't see on a screen like this. I would incur strongly encourage you to come into the museum and see it in person. Um, there are details that don't read on camera. You can't get that immersive sense that I'm getting unless you are here in front of it. Um, just so you know, I think everybody on this, cam on this um, broadcast probably already knows, but we're open. Thursday to Sunday, 10 in the morning till five in the evening. 
So come on in and selfishly, selfishly, I would really love it if you would come see me. Because <laughs> I would love more than anything to come up here with you and show this to you in person so that we could talk about it. Because you're only hearing about it today from my standpoint. I want to know what you think about it. You've kind of got some background now where you know what some of the clues are. How do you add it all up together? Maybe you've got different ideas than I did. You can enter them in the chat, of course, but you can come and see me and we can talk about it. Um, if you wanted to see me, I'll tell you, my shift is the first and third Saturday of every month with a tour at noon and a tour at one. That's if you see me in full like doesn't drag here, but if you come and I'm in shorts and a t-shirt and I'm still hanging out because I'm here almost every day, grab me anyway because I would love more than anything to come take a look at this painting with you and to hear what you have to say about it. So thank you, thank you, thank you everybody for joining us today. This has been Gallery Bites at the Crocker. I'm Sam, I'm a Crocker docent, proudly, and I'm looking very much forward to seeing you in the gallery.